Hi all, so today we're gonna to talk about a topic that I think is incredibly important and very few people really know about this topic and that is called affective immunology. Effective is essentially another word for saying emotional and immunology is the study of the immune system. So it's essentially the concept of how emotions affect our immune system. And for a lot of people, they don't even understand that the emotion can affect the immune system or that these are even connected in any way. But actually emotions and the immune system are connected quite closely and a lot of times our mental health can affect our physical health really directly. And so this, in this video, I'm gonna present four studies that really touch on this topic, and you will learn how emotions affect the immune system and what mechanisms are kind of in play here. At the same time, you will also learn how to really regulate your emotional state so that your immune system functions in its most optimal way for longevity and for combating illnesses such as viruses, bacteria, etc. which I'm sure all of you can kind of agree that in today's world, that is incredibly important. So first of all, let's look at this study called affective immunology. Okay, so the name of the study is affective immunology, where emotions and the immune system response converge. And this is essentially a literature review by Dr. Fulvio de Aquisto on this topic. And he is one of the primary scientists studying this very new field. And I think it is incredibly interesting. I think that this uh, article is actually public access. So I will link all of these studies below if you wanna take a closer look. But Dr. Akisto essentially talks about what is the correlation between emotional states and the immune response? And what are the systems that really drive both of these responses? So as we know, when it comes to mental health and physical health, a lot of diseases are actually quite connected. So we know that individuals that have cardiovascular diseases, that have autoimmune diseases, have a much higher risk of developing mental illnesses such as bipolar, um, depression, anxiety, etc. And we know that individuals with mental diseases often have a higher risk of developing physical diseases as well. So there's essentially a bi-directional relationship here. And the mediator in this relationship is really inflammation. And so a caveat about inflammation really quick is that inflammation is not evil. It is not like this horrible thing. Without inflammation, we would be all dead because inflammation is the immune system's upregulation response. And so whenever we are exposed to something that is threatening to our bodies, the immune system typically upregulates and tries to protect us. The issue is chronic inflammation. So when this response is never kind of tampered down and when we are always in this inflammation response or the inflammation response is just too extreme for kind of a normal range. So remember, inflammation, not always bad. Chronic inflammation, bad. So what happens is that we actually get inflammation from physical threats, but we also get inflammation from psychological threats. We know that if we are constantly kind of repeating or ruminating on a negative event or a negative emotion, we actually start to upregulate kind of a sympathetic response and then our immune system upregulates inflammation. And this can lead to chronic disease and chronic stress. And so inflammation is what kind of drives both of these processes. But I think we can go a little bit deeper here and thinking about, so how is the mind and the immune system actually connected and how are they similar? And so what happens is that they're actually really, really similar processes that don't seem similar. So the immune system is essentially designated to combat physical threats that can impact our bodies. So the immune system is on the lookout for anything that can infect us, that can make us sick, that could, um, so it monitors kind of what goes into our body via the digestive system. It monitors kind of respiratory viruses. It will, you know, initiate a fever response if it detects a virus or a bacteria in the body. And so it's there to protect us. And at the same time, our mind is actually there to protect us as well. And it is there to detect threats. So our, our thoughts are actually kind of inputs to our body and our mind to detect whether the environment is threatening or calm. Are you in a kind of happy, content environment or are you in a highly stressful, threatening environment? And based on those thoughts, your body will actually react in due form. And so you can imagine that if somebody is thinking kind of, many negative thoughts, having a lot of negative emotions, then the mind does its job and it's like, oh, okay, we see that we're getting a lot of information that the environment is threatening. We're gonna really upregulate that response, go into that sympathetic state and really upregulate inflammation. Both systems, although different, are essentially 
threat detection systems. And that, I think, is why we see so much similarities between the immune system and the emotional response system. So I wanna move on to our second study here, and that is called Positive Emotional Style Predicts Resistance to Illness After Experimental Exposure to the Rhinovirus or the influenza A virus. This was a study done on 193 individuals and they were exposed either to the rhinovirus or influenza virus. And in the study, they also tested whether individuals had positive emotional styles or negative emotional styles. A positive emotional style is essentially experiencing a much higher ratio of positive emotion to negative emotion. And so you can actually have a low, middle, or high positive emotional style. And you can imagine that if you have a high positive emotional style, you are experiencing significantly more more positive emotion than negative emotion. And they found that the higher the positive emotional style, the less likely individuals were to actually develop symptoms from the influenza or rhinovirus. And essentially that this positive emotional state was protective for them in getting sick, while individuals with more negative emotional styles were significantly more likely to get sick. I think that you can kind of all imagine how important this might be in today's kind of circumstances. And we're going to talk about more on how to kind of mitigate that ratio between positive emotional style and negative emotional style in a little bit. But I want to move on to another study that's quite popular in um, psychology, and that is called the nun study. So this study essentially examined the diaries, the journals of a group of nuns throughout their lifespan. They kept journals throughout the lifespan. And what it did was that it really analyzed the emotional words used in the study and they found that nuns who used more positive emotional words in their journaling had actually significantly longer lifespans than nuns who used less positive emotional words and used perhaps more negative emotional words. So again here we kind of see that the ratio is important and we see that it's not just important in terms of combating disease in the short term, but it's also important in improving longevity in the long term. And so I think that these are really building a foundation here and understanding that mental health is actually super linked to physical health, and it's actually a really important intervention. Oftentimes when people think about improving physical health, they think of kind of this triad of exercise, sleep, and nutrition. Although these things are extremely important, a lot of people find that they still don't feel their best when they optimize for exercise, sleep, and nutrition. And I think that mental health and having a more positive emotional style is really the missing link here for a lot of people. The exciting thing is, is that you can actually learn these things. There's several studies that actually indicate that psychoeducation is extremely effective. And there's quite a few scientifically proven methods to increase positive emotion, to increase contentment, and just have more life satisfaction and positive of emotion overall. If you are someone who thinks that they might be able to be diagnosed with a mental illness, then it might be helpful to work with a therapist to increase coping styles and increase capacity for positive emotion. And if you are someone who is considered more in the normal population, aka someone who does not identify with, as having a mental illness, you might then want to work with a coach who can help you learn these skills and really feel better day to day physically and mentally. And so I do want to touch on one more study, and that is a study on emotion length and severity and rumination. So rumination is essentially kind of that kind of hamster wheel that goes in our head. Think about something negative that happened. It can be a negative emotion or a negative event. And we are not specifically trying to problem solve for this event, but we are actually just thinking about it like thinking like oh my gosh I did so bad in that um, kind of presentation like uh, I was just like the worst you know what I mean and so as we kind of think about it think about it think about it we're taking up a lot of real estate in our brain on something that is highly stressful and our mind is able to really kind of interpret that data as a potential threat and something that is not right in our environment and as you can imagine this leads to a stress response and therefore a physical response in the body and that allows the body to prepare for fighting off pathogens or whatever other threats that may occur a lot of times we think that we need to solve for an emotion or that we need to um, really think about a negative event that happened and so we really think about it over and over again in this room in this style of rumination but all of the literature says that rumination is actually highly detrimental and is linked to a lot of physical and mental illnesses and so what I would actually offer you is that when you feel kind of a little bit stuck in this cycle you might want to actually just employ distraction that is not something you might expect to hear um, from some of the background in psychology but actually distraction can be highly effective in helping us kind of get over this trap of rumination and so you know you could just do something you like 
and you can leave kind of that thinking for later. You don't have to, you know, kind of never go back to it, but when you feel kind of really getting down in that spiral, you might want to just distract yourself. Another technique that might be useful that you can just start like today, right now, is gratitude. And we actually know that gratitude can be highly effective in increasing positive emotional styles. And it's actually been really well studied in the positive psychology space. So this intervention is actually called Five Good Things. And essentially what you do is in the morning, in the evening, whenever you want, you just write down five good things that you are grateful for in your day. And you just list out one sentence for each thing. It can be super small things, like you're just grateful for your cup of coffee in the morning, or it can be bigger things. Uh, sometimes smaller things are even more effective. And what happens here is that your brain actually starts to kind of start to notice the good things in your day as a way to prepare for this activity. So right now you might not be really kind of picking up on the things you're grateful for, but if you know that later in the day you're gonna do this activity, you're gonna to start to try to notice things because you know you have to have stuff to write down. You're essentially creating a habit of gratitude and you're increasing the amount of positive emotions you feel in the day. And even though that this activity might sound really simplistic, it is actually highly effective. And I will link some of the studies in relation to this as well below. So if this topic of effective immunology was interesting to you and you kind of like these videos with more research, uh, let me know, comment below. I'm really curious to know what you guys like and obviously I'm making videos for you all. So I wanna make sure that I'm kind of providing the content that everybody wants here. And if you have any questions, feel free to message me and I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I hope this was helpful and I will see you all next week.